dear participants, dear friends, on behalf of Kurtakat, I welcome you all to our panel debate, Cube Kurdistan region of Iraq, global influences, regional conflicts and future prospects. Even though developments in the context of Iran and Israel dominate the agenda, this panel debate is very well timed. After all, it is not just about Israel and Iran, but about developments in the entire Middle East, including international interactions and effects. Kurdistan was and is a hue in the Middle East. Therefore, developments cannot be considered without taking the Kurdish factor into account. In addition, Turkish President Erdogan has threatened to intensify attacks on the areas of the democratic autonomous administration of northern and eastern Syria, but above all, the Kurdistan region of Iraq and Shengal and Mahmoud as part of his expansionist foreign policy. Instead of explaining his losses in the local elections, Erdogan dedicated his speech on election night to the fight against Kurds. With today's panel debate, we would like to take an in-depth look at these developments, evaluate possible consequences, but also point out perspectives. I'm delighted that we have such excellent speakers. Let me introduce them firstly. Dr. Dastan Yasim is a political scientist. She did her doctoral thesis at the German Institute of Global Area Studies. Welcome, Dastan. Lulifer Koch studied political sciences and is international relations focus person of the Kurdistan National Congress. Welcome, Nulifer. Ökmundur Jonasson is a former Justice and Interior Minister of Iceland. Welcome, Ökmundur. Thank you. Jürgen Kluter is a former member of the European Parliament from Germany. Welcome, Jürgen. Hello. First, um, we will listen to the inputs of all speakers and afterwards we will have a QA session then you can, as the listeners, you can address your questions to the speakers. Let's start with you, Dastan. May I ask you to give us an overview on the political situation and atmosphere in the Kurdistan region of Iraq, please? Thank you very much, Dersim, and thank you to Kodakat for this invitation with these esteemed uh, speakers. Um, I will talk uh, shortly about the domestic situation in the Kurdistan region and um, lead on then to kind of the external um, actors that are coming in to lead over to what uh, Nilifer is also going to um, tell us. Um, so the big issue right now in the Kurdistan region is the question of the um, Kurdistan region elections. Um, they have been postponed over the last two years. So the last government that was elected was in 2018 under now Prime Minister um, Masul Barzani. Um, and this government has uh, significantly um, yeah, been a huge huge authoritarian switch um, in the Kurdistan region. Uh, although there has already been a very authoritarian tendency with also the prolonged presidency of Masoud Barzani and also the um, uh, referendum, the independence referendum that also had a huge, huge cost on the Kurdish public. Um, this uh, presidency, this um, uh, um, this uh, prime ministry of um, uh, Masoud Barzani and also the loss of significance of Nechirvan Barzani has really, really brought with itself major um, changes in the region. We see a huge militarization ever since Masoud Barzani is in power. Um, in fact, with Masoud Barzani, we have a person that is uh, from a very strong military and intelligence background um, and less than Nechirvan Barzani um, was more focused on business-related stuff and some type of diplomacy. Um, this was really much, much more um, uh, in the side of uh, military escalation and, of course, uh, the, the cooperation with Turkey uh, that we will probably hear about a lot today. 
Um, so the elections have been postponed for two years. Uh, basic reason is that there have been a lot of uh, a lot of animosity between the PUK and the KB KDP. Um, basically, the PUK has, in general, after the referendum, lost a lot of influence. A lot of the areas that were lost after the referendum and the takeover by the Iranian-backed Hashda Shabi, uh, which since 2018 is part of the Iraqi army, um, much of this uh, area belonged to PUK, and it was also a lot of uh, the areas where PUK got their revenue for. Um, since KDP and PUK are strongly patronistic parties, they rely on this kind of base, uh, popular base. They rely on the economic grounds that they had over there. Um, and they lost that to a big part. Um, they became very weak. Uh, also, there has been a great um, uh, struggle between um, the, the the heirs of the throne of the PUK, um, mostly uh, between uh, Bafu Talabani and Lahul Sheikh Jangi, which also um, brought a lot of instability to the PUK, while the KDP has always been more stable since it's mainly organized along the line of the Barzani family, especially um, the, the line of Masul Barzani. Um, and uh, yeah, so this has been some of the reasons why these two parties that share power yeah. between each other since um, 1991, um, since the establishment of the Kurdish Union officially, um, uh, since this time uh, have like this kind of 50-50 system and could not really agree on a lot of things, for example, the electoral law and a lot of other questions. And right now, um, the PUK has kind of teamed up with the uh, Federal Supreme Court of Iraq um, to uh, push for the date of the election to be on 10th of June. And not only that, um, for KDP having to follow a couple of things. Um, one question of uh, content is the matter of the minority seats. So the Kurdistan region uh, parliament has 100 seats and um, 11 of those, uh, um, 111 and 11 are, are um, 100 seats and 11 are um, uh, the minority seats. Um, and the problem with these minority seats is that um, mostly it, it has been used by KDP to kind of push their people that have been representative of different um, uh, sectarian uh, minorities, um, but in the end, it was basically 11 unofficial extra seats for the KDP. And PUK, that already lost a lot of voter support, um, was obviously not really happy with that and was contending that. On 23rd of March, the federal court of Iraq has decided that this is unconstitutional. Um, and also that the size of the Kurdistan region parliament is unconstitutional. Um, which in the Iraqi electoral law, it's true that per 30,000 inhabitants, um, there uh, should be um, one uh, representative seats, which for the um, population development in the Kurdistan region of Iraq would amount to like some 250 seats in the parliament instead of 100. So indeed, there is some points um, where there should be reform. Um, but basically, there is two problems in here. Uh, first is that after this court ruling, this federal court ruling, KDP has um, decided to boycott the elections. And as far as it looks right now, they are very serious about it. They have not submitted their list of candidates to the High Electoral Council. So for this election, the High Electoral Council of Iraq will be responsible, not the specific Kurdish Electoral Council. So they're really serious about boycotting this at this point. Um, and the problem is that KDP and PUK and the Kurdistan region are not really facing a democratic ally on the other side in Baghdad as well. The federal court is also organized along the lines of Muhassasa, Muhassasa system. So five, it's nine members of the Supreme Court. Five members are Shia, two are Kurdish and two are Sunni. So the Shia side always has the majority, which makes the federal court in many analysis a tool of Iran in many points. So, and also the other point is that what they are criticizing about the Kurdistan region is not implemented in Baghdad as well. The Iraqi government, uh, the Iraqi parliament has minority seats as well. So basically with such a ruling, they're ruling against themselves. So we see it's a lot of authoritarian actors uh, ruling against each other, boycotting each other, um, and basically making the political process in the Kurdistan region impossible in a country that is already a failed state. Um, we see that, um, this is the pattern how business is taken care of in Iraq in general. 
We have also seen that the fight between Baghdad and Erbil regarding oil exports um, has been solved in a court of arbitration in Paris. Um, and not only that, um, while there is not a federal and a regional legislation that could bring some clarity on the legality or illegality of uh, Kurdish oil exports um, to Turkey and other countries, um, uh, while this has not been managed neither on federal nor on regional um, level, um, actually we see that this court ruling in the court of arbitration was done based on a 1972 pipeline agreement between Saddam Hussein at this time and the Turkish government. So we see that actually it's um, Basi international law that is kind of managing uh, internal questions that have not been taken care of ever since the establishment of um, uh, the Republic of Iraq um, as a so-called democracy and the Kurdistan region of Iraq. Many points are open and uh, this is, uh, escalation is happening right now as we see a regional escalation. On the one side, um, we have seen that uh, Recep Tayyip Erdogan has announced that in June, so the same month when this election is supposed to be happening, um, has announced that he wants to make a military operation um, in the framework of um, the Panchakral operations, but this time very greatly in Gare. Gare is also one of the regions where um, uh, the Turkish army was very much defeated in the last years and could not really progress against the PKK um, and the armed forces. Um, so this time with this escalation, it is supposed that they want to go far, far more in, but the escalation is already going on. 80% um, of the villages in this area are depopulated. People have been um, pushed out of their habitat. Um, and at the same time, people are dying because of drone attacks every day. Just three days ago, a man was killed in the village of uh, Galala, which is also in this uh, area uh, north of Mawet in Slemania province. So we see that the attacks are increasingly also going into the, the south, southeast of, of Kurdistan region. Um, and then on the other side, we have the escalation, obviously, from Iran. Uh, Iran has completely hollowed out whatever institutional framework is left of Iraq and Kurdistan region. Um, practically, uh, armed forces, uh, judiciary, um, government, most things are in the hands of Iran. And, and pretty much... Um, uh, and, and pretty much every single way they can attack of regions and, and areas in the Kurdistan region and beyond. Uh, on the one side, we've seen that, for example, the big attack on Pesha Dizzi, the CEO of the Falcon Group, um, him being killed with his family was directly done by an um, Iranian uh, strike. And these strikes are happening um, very often also against the Kurdish opposition, the Euro Kurdish Iranian opposition that is pre present in the Kurdistan region. And we have also seen that um, uh, obviously, uh, Mohammed Shia Sudani, the, the Iraqi prime minister, was directly invited yesterday to, to Washington, D.C. By, by, by President Biden, because it's very clear that everything that is happening with this escalation between Iran and Israel is immediately going to affect the situation in, in Iraq um, and, and the region overall, and Kurdistan region as well. So um, it's a really big escalation and things are really serious. And um, quite frankly, with many people that also engage with the question of the Kurdistan region of Iraq, for many people, it's clear that this is a decisive moment that is going to also um, yeah, change or, or, or kind of predict whether um, Kurdistan region is as a construct, as an autonomy going to survive overall um, or not. Um, I will keep it at that for now. Uh, a lot of information already, and I'm happy to answer any other questions. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, Dustin, for your important contribution. Let's continue with you, dear Nilifer. Uh, I mentioned in my introduction, and also Dustin mentioned it, the threats of uh, Erdogan regarding a uh, new military operation in Rojava, but especially in the Kurdistan region of Iraq. May I ask you, for an assessment also in the context of international and regional connotations and, of course, in the context of the latest developments, um, especially between Iran and Israel. Thanks. Uh, thank you, Dersim, and thank you, Kurt Akka team, for organizing um, such important uh, panel debate uh, because um, Iraq is continuing to be... Um, let's say century or not century, but tens of years a problem. Uh, it's getting under the shadow of the Iraq, Iranian Israeli war, but Iraq, uh, I think is the, is a kind of prime example of whole Middle East. When we talk about Iraq, we should uh, consider that Iraq became a kind of battlefield between of all the regional and global players so competing each other. 
And I would say that Iraq is a kind of soccer field, particularly um, uh, since the fall, um, since the um, Gulf War, 1991. Uh, Iraq is, um, I say it's a prime example uh, how you maintain a permanent crisis and chaos in a region uh, for the benefit of global players and also regional. When I talk about regional player, I will focus mostly on Turkey and Iran because uh, they have century old uh, battle and um, struggle to get to become the hegemon regional uh, power of uh, middle east it's a kind of continuation of not finished uh, struggle between the safavids and ottomans so this we have always to consider when we talk about iraq or uh, southern part of kurdistan Ira Ira kurdistan region of iraq and since uh, 34 years, we have also the U.S. in the region and then some other states. But uh, the three main players are Turkey, Iran and the U.S. So Iraq is a kind of a, um, uh, it's a center of the gravity of uh, the third war, actually, where it started already in 91 and it's continuing. And I think this is a kind of a principle of the third war to keep uh, states who are so far new designed, but as a center of chaos and crisis and uh, this is Iraq actually I would say and the new threat uh, which is increasing on Iraq is um, the statement given by Turkish President Erdogan on 3rd of March saying uh, we will um, start a new military offensive to whatever he said uh, we will clean Terroristan he is now uh, transferring Kurdistan's name to Terroristan means the country of terror terror um, and uh, for that purpose, since uh, February this year, many um, Turkish high-ranking delegations have been in Baghdad and Iraqi, Iraqi um, authorities have been visited uh, Ankara. Later on, Iran came to boat, um, sent the leader of Heshti Shabi to Ankara. However, Heshti Shabi itself is not the official army, but there have been... Um, welcomed accordingly to protocol rules in Ankara. And it seems that Iran is also very active since the Gaza war particularly to, um, however, to, um, to, to give Turkey some compromises in case of getting Turkey away from the U from US and NATO particularly, this is Iranian game, uh, and also putting pr uh, pressure on the Kurdish um, PUK and KDP uh, not to be um, to become under Iranian control instead of getting in dialogue with the U.S. So this is a problem now. But I think the main threat is will be um, after Erdogan's visit to Washington in, on the 9th of May. Since yesterday, high-ranking U.S. Um, State Department delegation is now in Ankara. They will prepare Erdogan's um, visit. And I think this time Erdogan's uh, visit will... First, they ask for permission for the new wave of escalation, with always with the pretext of existence of PKK. Uh, it's since um, since thirty four years the same argument. So the PKK is there. We have to go, get get there and clean the PKK. This is our duty as a member state of the NATO. So that in this, he, I think you will try. Erdogan will try to convince President Biden. Uh, Erdogan needs immediately or urgently such kind of war, particularly after his historical defeat in municipal elections on the 31st of uh, March in Kurdistan. And I think also the uprising of one million people in the, just in the Kurdish city of Van was encouraging also the Turkish opposition. I think the Kurds have been playing a very, very important role during the municipal elections, offering the Turkish social democrats and all other opposition groups um, to act more offensive against our Erdogan, to use their arguments more offensive, offensively against Erdogan. And I think in this, the Kurds have been playing a leading role how democratization in Turkey can be done. And I think acting with the Turkish opposition was a very, uh, very uh, strategic, smart point of a strategy. And now it's our duty to build up on this. But um, on the other hand, this will be the reason Erdogan again will then go back uh, to his old car to punish the Kurds because we helped to help the CHP to get the city of Istanbul, which was the city of Erdogan's dream as the Sultan of uh, the Caliphate, which he was supposed to build in, in 2014 through the Islamic State. 
and he thought he will get back Istanbul to make Istanbul a new capital of his uh, new Ottomanism. And I think the Kurds have um, have prevented uh, this dream of Erdogan. That's why he he will uh, start the war uh, after he get he got. And we we hope uh, that the U.S. administration wouldn't give him the green light uh, for a new military war. And I think one other reason why um, um, I think the main reason is of course to maintain his power because after domestic defeat in Turkey and Bakur in northern part of Kurdistan. And because of misguiding of the state, the failure to run the state, Turkey is since long a time economic, economically in a very deep crisis. Uh, for this purpose, uh, Erdogan is also planning to put uh, pressure on Iraq, and he achieved a lot in this case in the last months to build up the so-called Turkey-Iraqi um, development road from Basra, the port of Fao, to uh, through southern Kurdistan and then to northern Kurdistan from there, from, from Turkey to Europe, he will build up new um, trade road as alternative um, to the Indian Middle East economic corridor. So, and uh, he need investments from Qatar and other Arab states and they say, well, we will help you. Uh, but there's 300 kilometers of area which are very threatening where the PKK is acting. So first what you do is um, get uh, up from this obstacle, clean the PKK, then we will uh, finance, we will uh, invest in this new Turkey-Iraqi development road. So it's supposed to be 1,200 1, kilometers from Basra to crossing both parts of Kurdistan, South and North Kurdistan, I mean, Turkey and Iraqi part of Kurdistan. And with this, Erdogan uh, is going um, to gain economic power to continue his policy of ethnic cleansing uh, in Northern Kurdistan, Southern Kurdistan, and also West Rojava. Uh, so the, and I think the, he believes that uh, another reason why he could get green lights from the US is that um, um, the U.S. itself is now running election campaign, and most of the state are not trying to uh, get the last permissions from the uh, from Joe Biden before um, because it's not clear who is going to be the next president of U.S. Whatever is Donald Trump or Joe Biden is not clear, but since it's Joe Biden now, Turkey is using this opportunity and also other states, and I think the visit of Iraqi Prime Minister is also. Um, <clears throat> Uh, look, because Iraq itself is uh, like Dastan was uh, issuing, uh, raising this, it's uh, also in a deep economic crisis. And uh, it depends also on this so-called uh, trade, new trade road. Erdogan is calling this as the new Silk Road. And for that purpose, I think um, there was an agreement recently made between Ankara and Baghdad. Uh, it's a, for um, mutual um, benefit for both states, uh, this uh, trade road. And... Um, and otherwise, um, uh, Iran is keeping a blunt eye in case of this trade road because it's also somehow crossing the so-called area of the uh, Shia zone, which is crossing Sh uh, Sh uh, Sinjar, the Yazidi area, until Lebanon, etc., etc. Um, and uh, it will, um, and I think that's the reason why the elections in Ira southern Kurdistan, Iraqi Kurdistan, will be postponed. I don't think they will have uh, we will have the elections in June. They will wait uh, for Turkish war, particularly the Kurdistan Democratic Party, which is playing a very uh, threatening uh, policy regarding Kurdish national interests, because um, uh, we have been able to defeat Erdogan politically in Kurdistan itself during municipal elections. And also militarily, Erdogan was not able to keep his army in many of the strategic location in um, the mountainous area of southern Kurdistan, northern Iraq. And the only way um, Erdogan uh, can gain a lot of uh, get result is getting the KDP much more on the boat. Let's say when KDP is, for example, uh, cutting the roads for logistics, etc., etc., emptying the villages around the mountainous area, which the KDP is doing since the time. So for that, uh, the Kurdistan National Congress will have its annual meeting the next weekend, and then we will talk uh, in details uh, what how we can uh, bring KDP, prevent KDP's um, dipping in co co cooperation with Turkey, 
because we say when we together in kind of national in a kind of strategic of national unity, if we would close our doors for Erdogan's expansionism, then I think uh, we can get rid of him because he's a threat not just for the Kurds in northern Kurdistan but also Rojava. And one part of the of the plan with this new uh, escalation military offensive is getting some strategic areas under control from where he can easily uh, pass to Rojava also. So let's say uh, he is planning um, in the center of the Gari Mountains from where he can move, uh, he can control southern Kurdistan, uh, act also in northern Kurdistan, also occupy Rojava. So, and this uh, will, of course, uh, such a kind of war will bring the whole region un out of the control. That's what I think because it will open gates for other states to intervene. Uh, and uh, we will start new campaign to try to convince President Biden not to uh, give Erdogan a permission for a war, because uh, you know that you, from US perspective, Iraq uh, was liberated from Saddam, as the US is um, saying uh, it belongs to them. So it's new colonial power of Iraq. Um, and the importance is the stance of the U.S. concerning the Kurds. This is not clear. We don't know. So we want to have also some campaigns um, to say that uh, we will defeat, uh, we will not allow Erdogan to occupy our land. Uh, well, this is from our my per, from our perspective, there is uh, But true is that um, uh, he will try everything Erdogan to maintain his power, and this is uh, the only option he has now is this war because he invested a lot politically and diplomatically to benefit from the Israel uh, Hamas war. And then it came out he was playing a double game one side speaking on behalf of the Palestinians, on the other side, continuing with military and economic trade with Israel. And this was the main argument uh, which led um, for his political defeat in Turkey itself. So and uh, that means in 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 um, in international political agendas like it was happened previously with Israel and Hamas and now Israel and Iran, uh, Turkey nobody is uh, taking Turkey serious anymore. Nobody trusts in Erdogan's policy of double dub double game, and that's why he needs he need a war uh, against the Kurds to uh, um, well to maintain his power. Yeah, thank you very much, dear Nullifar, for your important remarks. Uh, dear Jürgen, let's continue with you. Recently, at the end of January, you visited the Kurdistan region of Iraq together with Okmundur. May I ask you to share your impressions uh, of the trip to South Kurdistan, the current situation on the ground in general and uh, in the context of Turkey in particular? My microphone, yes. Um, yeah, first of all, thank you very much for inviting uh, Edmundo and, and me to um, speak about our impressions and uh, our debates we have had in uh, Ira uh, in Erbil, mainly in Erbil, but we have been uh, one and a half day in Suleymania as well uh, and meet uh, people there. Uh, yes, uh, the target of our delegation was uh, to meet uh, the boards of uh, the Kurdish parties uh, and uh, to have an exchange with them, uh, with them about uh, the question of restarting a peace process uh, to end all these conflicts you spoke about, uh, Nilufer and uh, das, uh, Dastan. Uh, and uh, the, the other point was uh, which role um, a relief of uh, Öcalan uh, place uh, in, in this uh, procedure. Uh, yeah, um, the, the, the first impression, the, the main impression was that uh, everybody, uh, that, that every uh, um, party uh, says, yes, we, we, we want uh, to find a way out of these conflicts. Uh, we, uh, in, in general, we support uh, all efforts to uh, come back to, to a, a peace procedure, to a peace process. Uh, and 
nobody uh, spoke against the uh, uh, release uh, of uh, Achalan. Uh, I think that was uh, at all a very positive uh, aspect uh, of, of our uh, visits and uh, our debates uh, we had. But you can see as well some some small differences, and uh, it, it's it's not so clear for me how big they they are in reality or how big they can uh, uh, can become. Uh, the difference is that that uh, some parties says yes, okay, we uh, we agree that uh, Achalan should be um, uh, come uh, sh should be freed, uh, should be released. But Öcalan is not the only man, the only person in prison. There are some other people as well, journalists uh, in, in Turkey, uh, hundreds and thousands of uh, journalists are in, in prison, uh, Turkish uh, politicians, uh, Turkish mayors in uh, Kurdish mayors in, in uh, Turkey are in prisons as well. And uh, what's about uh, these people? Um, that was not a, a speech against uh, to 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 release Öcalan, but it shows that some parties says it's not enough only to speak about uh, Öcalan. We we have to widen this uh, this uh, debate. This was one point. Another point that was uh, interesting. Uh, I yes, I'm I'm in contact with with with, uh, with the Kurds and and uh, with with the Kurdish parties uh, in uh, Turkey, and uh, it's normal for me that uh, the liberation of women uh, and women rights plays an important part in the HDP or in uh, DRM now, it is uh, how it is called now, uh, and in the previous parties, uh, and it was very very strange for me to see that in all the meetings with one exception uh, women are not on uh, on the place uh, in in including you you know the the, the people are very uh, kindly and uh, if you arrive you get some water some coffee some tea uh, and uh, everything has been served by men and we didn't see any women uh, they they were in in this context in this political context uh, entirely excluded from 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 our meetings uh, and that was uh, really really surprising and really really strange for me I I have to say there was only a young party I don't remember at the moment uh, the, the name we met them uh, we met them in uh, Sulemania. Uh, they, uh, this party um, has been um, established ten years ago, and and they follow the principles of uh, Öcalan, and that was the only party uh, where women were included, and that raises the question for me: how how close can can or yeah how close can can the Kurdish uh, communities uh, or the Kurds work together? In the different parts of Kurdistan, uh, if if you have one part uh, of of Kurdistan where uh, women are not present in in the in the political uh, um, sector, uh, and in other parts uh, it is normal uh, normal, and and in other parts uh, women play uh, an important role in in political uh, debates, in political in the political life, then then I think that's. It is not so easy to 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 come to a common uh, base uh, of, of political action. It's a yeah a, a very personal impression I had, but uh, it it seems that that it could become uh, really a problem. Another point is we we spoke with with our translator as well and uh, Agmondo and and me and and our interpreter. Uh, we uh, shared the same hotel, and in the evening we had a lot of time and to to speak and to to have exchanges. And what what I what I found is that in Iraq it is not so clear than than in uh, southern uh, in, in North um, Syria in, in Rojava and uh, in Turkey. Uh, the political parties in that 
parts of Kurdistan say very clear, we want the autonomy, but we respect the borders, uh, the existing borders, uh, and we want um, autonomy in, uh, in, in the frame of the existing borders. It was not so entirely clear for me whether this is the same position for all parties uh, in, in, in the North Iraq. It's, it's a question more than, than, than a thesis, but uh, I, I'm, I'm not really sure about that. Uh, so that I think there, there are some, some internal questions they have to be clarified between the, the, the courts as well. That's one point. The other point is, uh, and, and that picks uh, up what uh, Dastan and, and Nilif, uh, Nilifer already mentioned, uh, it is not a question only uh, of, uh, of the Kurds uh, to, to work together and uh, to come back to, the, uh, uh, to, to a way uh, of peace. It uh, depends on other uh, countries, on other political uh, powers as well. And as you mentioned, it's Iran and, and Turkey. They have their very own interests. Uh, and uh, Agmunda and, and me, we, we debated it uh, already a little bit uh, on the spot in, in Erbil. Uh, it seems to be really, really difficult uh, to, to restart a peace process in this uh, political context, you have on one hand uh, the Kurdish, uh, the, the Israeli uh, and um, conflict uh, with Hamas, with, with the Palestinian, uh, Palestine, uh, Palestine uh, population, and uh, with with Hamas, um, and that is obviously used and and, and the peaceful uh, the. The Iranian attacks, uh, it is not very clear uh, whether the, we, we heard different uh, estimations about uh, the attacks uh, at that time uh, on, on, North, uh, on South Kurdistan. Uh, one, some people say it, uh, it is uh, the, the Iranian uh, attacks uh, are uh, yeah, a communication to the USA and uh, to the US government and to Israel. Uh, they, they, at that moment, now it changed uh, the last week and uh, it changed a little bit. But at that time, uh, they say they said uh, the Iran is not ready to to attack uh, the U.S. Uh, and uh, Israel directly, and therefore they uh, attack uh, people in, uh, uh, in in South Kurdistan. Uh, at that time, there was, there was a family killed uh, by 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 a missile. Uh, a very rich uh, business family, and uh, a part of uh, of the people say that uh, Iran and that was communicated in international uh, newspapers and medias as well. Uh, that Iran says we killed some uh, people. They they belong to the uh, Israeli uh, secret service Mossad, but other people uh, in Abel. Uh, had a different uh, estimation. It is not a contradiction, but it's a different uh, estimation. They said it was an um, attack against uh, the economy in uh, northern Iraq because uh, northern Iraq is uh, uh, has a stable, uh, more or less stable um, economy and a successful uh, economy. And uh, Iran tries uh, to, to de destabilize uh, the economic situation uh, in northern Iraq. Uh, OK, that, that's uh, difficult to say uh, what, what's the right estimation. And from my point of view, it is not uh, necessarily uh, a contradiction. But it shows uh, there, that there are different Different uh, interests uh, coming in the in the playing field. The other point is, uh, yeah, the, the both uh, ruling parties. Uh, when we met them, they asked uh, to, to understand uh, that they deal with uh, Iran and especially with the Turkish government. They say we have to deal with them because uh, otherwise uh, our economy will be uh, destabilized uh, and, and weakened, uh, and therefore we have to deal with them, and they ask us uh, to understand that. Um, yeah. And then you have the situation 
all the, you, you have the Turkish government, uh, and if you want to, if if, if you say a key uh, a key role in in the peace process uh, plays the PKK uh, and the Öcalan, uh, that means uh, Öcalan, uh, to to uh, to release Öcalan on one hand and on the other hand uh, to withdraw the PKK from the terror list from the EU terror list. Um, then you can see that that's really that's really difficult. Uh, you you have uh, in order to to release Öcalan, you have to to increase the pressure to the Turkish government, but the Turkish government have some uh, uh, some 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 power against uh, the EU. They can say we can open the border, then you will have uh, the problem uh, with uh, refugees again. Or we can increase uh, the conflict uh, about uh, refugees in the EU by opening the borders. That's one point. The other point is that uh, Erdogan is uh, that, that Turkey is a um, member of the NATO, and the NATO uh, is uh, indir indirectly involved in the uh, war in the Ukraine. And uh, the NATO is uh, interested uh, to to keep uh, uh, Erdogan uh, in in uh, on the on the side uh, of uh, of the NATO. So you can't increase the political pressure uh, too much to to Erdogan or to the government of uh, Turkey. That's a problem, and the further problem, uh, and, and the further problem concerning the uh, with, uh, withdrawal uh, of PKK from the uh, EU terror list is that you need an agreement of all the uh, members uh, of the Council of the EU, and currently the German government never will agree, and as long as the German government. Uh, will not agree uh, with the withdrawal of the PKK from the terror list, uh, you, you can't withdraw it. Uh, and uh, that raises for me the question, uh, what could be done to convince, to, yeah, to convince the German government uh, to change their, uh, uh, their position? And, and uh, with, with, without uh, a pressure, a political pressure, or... Uh, some some tries to convince them to change their their political position. Uh, a peace process, uh, from my point of view, is not realistic. Uh, from from my point of view, uh, the German government plays uh, a crucial role as well. It's not the only crucial role, but it is a crucial role uh, of of the German government, by my point of view. Okay, now I I, I will stop, uh, and uh, I agreed with um, Agmondo by email that I will uh, give the floor to Agmondo uh, now, and uh, Agmondo will add some uh, of of his uh, impressions and and his uh, observations as well. Yes. Okay. Thank you very much, dear Jürgen. Yeah, Agmondo, then the floor is yours. Thank you very much. And I would like to uh, thank the K and K for inviting me to uh, to Basur. Uh, and uh, I found this a very educational visit. Uh, also, the discussions I had with Jürgen there, I learned a lot from them and with Sineb. Uh, and uh, Jürgen is absolutely right about the impression we got of of gender, uh, the gender situation in 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 uh, Basur compared to what we know from from Turkey uh, in that respect. But then again, uh, Sinep was uh, the co-chairman of the KNK, was the obvious leader of this delegation and that I think made an impact uh, on itself on its own uh, I I think uh, that uh, uh, speaking for myself that in my weaknesses lie my strengths in the sense that uh, 
the superficiality of my knowledge about Basur uh, became my strength in the sense that I was not burdened with knowledge of, uh, of uh, hostilities or animosities within the uh, Basur political culture. So we came there as rather as a unifying force rather than a divisive force. And this is uh, how we try to portray ourselves in the talks we had with individual parties and at the press conferences we had. Now, uh, and I think that was very important, that we did not go into any intricacies in the political situation at all. Uh, rather than uh, speak on behalf of k and k the big umbrella organization. And as Jürgen has explained, uh, what we were saying were two things in, uh, in particular. We were, we, were, uh, we were trying to ask people to have a concerted effort unified effort to stop the atrocities by the uh, by the Turks in the in the border regions and then secondly uh, to uh, talk for the release of Abdullah Öcalan and the beginning start of the of the peace process again these were the two main objectives of uh, our our talks now we had uh, meetings with or we had rather contacts with representatives of all political parties in Basur. Also the ruling parties, although th this was through the, uh, the, the parliamentary organization of the former MPs, but the, the ties were there. And this led, I think, to open the opening up of all media in, in, uh, in, uh, in Basur. So we were, our presence was uh, well felt. Now, uh, I, when I say I learned a lot, uh, I learned a lot about the geopolitical complexities uh, of Basur with uh, all these uh, states around, uh, those who sometimes portray themselves as friends, but when you look at it, they do not have fingers, they all have claws. Everybody wanting, all these uh, so-called friends wanting to undermine uh, 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 the state of, of Basur. Definitely the Iranians, definitely the, the Turks, and definitely Baghdad as well. No, none of these wants a strong Basur. That, that's obvious. And this uh, creates a very, very difficult uh, situation. Now, uh, I say that sometimes in the weaknesses lies the strength. And the weakness of the geopolitical situation we find ourselves in now is, uh, of course, the danger of escalation. Escalation of uh, uh, the conflict uh, and the war in, in uh, Gaza, in Israel, uh, and uh, uh, and elsewhere, and uh, now the recent uh, attacks, drone attacks, and retaliation uh, brings home the knowledge or the the the, the idea that this could be a, a, a serious threat to 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 the Middle East and to the to the world even. And uh, when I say that in this this weakness, this dangerous, uh, uh, the, the, this danger, lies an opening for us, I think. Because uh, what people are saying is that uh, a war in Gaza may lead to a war elsewhere. What we were saying, yes, but we can reverse this as well and say peace in one place can lead to peace in another place. So it's a reversed domino theory. And 
uh, when we spoke on those terms, uh, people understand that uh, the freeing of Abdel Ocalan and opening the peace process in Turkey with the Kurds could benefit the whole region and be beneficial for uh, peace uh, in the world, you know, because this is what people are fearing, uh, fearing now. So, uh, and I think our task, you know, when for, for us who come from the outside, so to speak, Jürgen and I and, and others in Europe, is to convince Europe. Because as Jürgen was explaining, uh, for instance, the German government is 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 immovable when it comes to uh, Turkish uh, German relations and and uh, Kurds as well. But uh, therefore, we must try to mobilize as many people as possible, as many po forces as possible within the uh, European Parliament, with the uh, within the Council of Europe, and and everywhere. And the key uh, key. Uh, Issue here is also what Jürgen uh, pointed out that uh, the PKK be removed from the terrorist. That's absolutely essential, and uh, it's uh, Im uh, Im important to bring this home to 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 Biden, who is of course meeting Erdogan, as Nulifer was reminding us on the 9th of May, and we are in the process of preparing a letter. For him, urging him to uh, come to the, uh, come to that, and I reading the citation from uh, Biden uh, from way back in 2019, before he became president, very very pro Kurdish statements. Uh, how is he going to react now when he meets Erdogan, who whom he had not so. Uh, nice words about in those days in, in at the end of 2019 now all this is important but I'm, I'm i'm saying this that in the weaknesses the world is facing now the dangers the world is facing now lies an opening for us for the cool discourse i i think i think that uh, uh, my evaluation is that uh, our visit to Basur was was uh, successful, of course, on a very small scale, but as a little little contribution. Outsiders coming there, uh, outsiders from uh, Europe, as a unifying force under the umbrella and in the name of the KNK. I think that that was also good. And under the leadership of a woman, who who uh, uh, was came out as a very very strong spokesman for the Kurdish cause in 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 general, so that's my evaluation of our visit, and uh, what I see as uh, possible openings uh, uh, for us, and what we must work for now is uh, the withdrawal from the terror list of uh, Abdul Ocalan and PKK. That's that's absolutely uh, essential. And to emphasize again, when, when uh, you see, we never, we took care never to go into any details uh, with, with, with anybody. We, we pretend, we pretended as if we didn't uh, understand or were not interested in what divided people, but only what unified people around the Kurdish course. Thank you very much, dear Wunder. Uh, thank you very much to all speakers for the important remarks. Uh, now, you, dear participants who have been listening for one hour, uh, can ask questions. The floor is is yours.
or maybe there are questions from speakers to other speakers. This is also possible. I, I just want to say that I yes. I found it very very informative and interesting to to listen to Dastan and Nilufer on the political uh, situation, and I think it is I think it is very very important to to bring this out to the wider world, and this is what the visit taught me, as I as I say, you know how little I. I knew about the situation and how important it is to fill in the picture uh, for us. Thank you very much. Uh, I have a question uh, to Nurifer. Nurifer, normally uh, we have this military, intensified military operations before the elections. Uh, what do you think why Erdogan uh, waited this time? I think you waited for the elections, the result of election, and uh, as you followed up there, Sim, he was deploying several ten thousand of soldiers, officers, etc., etc., to um, Kurdish regions to manipulate uh, the polls. And before that, uh, he was using all the media. I, I would say we have been actually competing with the state, not with Erdogan. He was using all the instruments of the state. And I guess um, uh, he would. I think he 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 was expecting uh, success because he was in um, coalition with the fascist MHP and also some of the other five parties actually in Kurdistan. They acted all together, whatever they are now uh, in competition to each other. But in case of Kurds, Kurds they are unified like Deva parties, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And I think this time we made a very, we, we used a very smart strategy. So we said uh, our liberty also needs um, a common, common ground, uh, political common ground with the Turkish progressive forces. It doesn't mean, I don't mean the CHP as a, a progressive force because the CHP is the first party in Turkish history which signed the Lausanne treaty uh, which denied the existence of the Kurds, but I think uh, they have seen that uh, with Erdogan, Turkey is going to bankrupt, bankrupt um, to the chaos. Uh, and that's why um, they have been following somehow the, the, uh, the dynamic of Kurdish politics in Turkey. Uh, so we have been also encouraging another alternative party to the AKP, which is also Islamic, the so-called Yeniden Rafa Party, see, which is a small party. But now they gained a lot of strength during the elections. And now there are the Islamist, other Islamic movements are unifying against Erdogan. So I think this is a good time um, we have as a, um, as a result. And that's why I would agree with Okmundar and Jürgen that uh, we have one side to be prepared for a war because we are sure that Erdogan needed war. Diplomatically, he lost our confidence. I mean, when we see the games he played, I mean, in, in the case of uh, in, in, in time um, in the Ukraine and Russian war, his double game brought some results for Turkey. But uh, since the Gaza-Israeli war, there is no uh, result for Turkey and also now in Iran-Israel conflict. I won't say it's a war, but it's a kind of aggressive flirt between two states who are looking for hegem regional hegemony so far Israel and Iran. And Turkey is selling itself as a mediator. And I think another point why Erdogan have been starting earlier this war is... Uh, uh, the very important meeting last year in July in India, the G20 meeting, which was bypassing Turkey by signing a new agreement of the so-called Indian Middle East economic, uh, economic Corridor. So as you know, since the foundation of Turkey as a state, it was a kind of acting as a bridge between East and West, between Asia and Europe as a a bridge for trade uh, and also as a kind of threatening instrument from west to east or east to west. So this, um, during the last year talks in India, I think Turkey's 
role as a bridge between East and West was bypassed. So new uh, as alternative to China, they have been looking more down uh, to the ocean instead of allowing the Silk Road of China. And, I, and as you remember, immediately after the agreement was signed, Erdogan gave a statement, say, hey, you can't bypass Turkey. And he was uh, threatening. And I think uh, since last year, July, he was uh, actually preparing uh, to get more, to put more pressure on Iraq by using the PKK as a pretext. I don't think the PKK is a real reason. Erdogan, um, um, the reason why the Turkish state itself was maintaining Erdogan is because they thought through Erdogan uh, they can uh, improve Turkish interest in Middle East. First, in, in both in two main weak states, Iraq is a weak state and also Syria. So and Erdogan see this as a golden opportunity to fulfill, fulfill his dream of new Ottomanism because still he do accept whole southern Kurdistan, which is the northern Iraq, or the Kurdistan region of Iraq. He do think this is still the former province of Mosul of the Ottoman Empire. So and also in Rojava, accordingly to Erdogan, is the former province of Aleppo of Ottoman Empire. And he was already occupying three important regions of uh, Kurdish region of Iraq, Syria, Rojava, Afrin, Selikani, Grisipi. And in Iraqi Kurdistan, he has now built up 87 military headquarters. And parallelly to this, he has a, a strong ties, a strong ground of uh, economic um, investments. And he is also controlling somehow the media, the politics of media in Iraqi Kurdistan. Uh, and he is also interestingly, using Turkish culture for assimilating the Kurds in Iraqi Kurdistan. So there is a kind of new colonialism uh, for Southern Kurdistan. So then the question is, what, what, what has to be done? I won't wait for delisting the PKK, this and that. It can take time. As you remember, in case of ANC, after the liber after Mandela was liberated, South Africa became a democracy. Then they withdrew the ANC from the list of terrorist organization. So what has to be done is now that in our common analysis we have to see Turkey as the main threat, uh, and what can keep Turkey away from um, be be being the bad boy of the region is. Um, showing Turkey also the address of the solution. And in this, I fully agree with Jürgen and Otmunder. So um, um, saying Turk, the, the Turkish opposition, I won't apply to an Erdogan anymore, but applying to the Turkish opposition, uh, uh, the CHP and others also saying, well, if you want to keep Turkey, to transfer Turkey to democratic state, then open the door of Imrala. Uh, getting back the pro peace process of 2013-2015. Uh, so this is not possible. And I think, uh, I don't think it's just the issue of Iran's or U.S. intervention. Uh, we have to believe also in domestic people's power in Turkey and Kurdistan itself. Uh, from the perspective of states, it's clear they are interested in producing chaos crisis like we see in Iraq and other states. But I think... Another option is also bringing um, people's power together who are represented by different different political uh, wings. I think this is possible. And if we can make a democratic change in Turkey, then I think that will affect uh, the situation of the Kurds in Syria and Iraq. And also it can balance Iran because Iran, uh, comparing with Turkey, has a very different uh, tradition of being a state. So Iran is more flexible. Iran is the center of Machiavellism. It can change the politics. So, but in case of Turkey, uh, I think uh, we have to focus on Turkey. That's what I would say because it's just uh, spreading uh, destabilization, spreading militarism and aggression. Not just by selling drones to every country now, but also intervening everywhere using Islam. I mean, we are talking in case of Southern Kurdistan about PUK and KDP, but we shouldn't underestimate the power the Islamist movement got also. A small political parties are gaining a lot of support now amongst the people because they are paid by different states who are using Islam as a political tool for their power. 
So and this is also now a threat. And since Jürgen and uh, Otmunder were raising the issue of women, uh, so most of the parties now who are increasing their influence politically, they force women to for housewifeification, for example, so particularly in southern Kurdistan. They tried the same also in in northern Kurdistan through the so-called new Hezbollah, the Hudapar. But the Kurdish people respond to say we we reject we don't uh, we don't need you in uh, south in northern Kurdistan, the Turkish part of Kurdistan. But this is a new other threat to southern Kurdistan, which I would like to add. Why you can't see women in politics there? I mean, there are brave women I've seen. I've personally working for more than ten years in southern Kurdistan in both parts, in the green zone and the yellow zone. Uh, Kurdistan itself is unfortunately practically divided into centers. And I've seen uh, women, but uh, so all the achievement of the women uh, in the last years influenced by the women's resistance in other parts of Kurdistan, whether it's Xinjiang in, in Rojlat, Kurdistan, Iranian occupied part, or uh, the Kurdish women's movement in Rojava and Bakur, Kurdistan. So there is a kind of influencing each other at national level. So, but the threat uh, is now also the third wing of politics in southern Kurdistan, which are the um, Islamist parties. Uh, some are supported by Iran, some by Turkey. And this is a serious threat now, um, bringing back southern Kurdistan, whole Kurdistan to the mid age. Yeah, thank you. Um, das dann Okmundur and Jürgen pointed out the gender aspects in the Kurdistan region of Iraq, especially within the political parties there. May I ask you for a comment on this issue too, please? Yeah, I mean, I, I totally get it. I've been working for a long time there as well. And um, I guess when you're also a young Sudanese speaking woman, you get a very deep insight into kind of the mechanisms of misogyny that are playing. Um, I think there are a lot of women that are very active and changing a lot of stuff in Kurdistan region. Um, but I think the most intelligent thing for them is just not to engage in party politics. If party politics in Iraqi Kurdistan is patriarchal, then it's evident that an intelligent feminist woman would not engage in it. Um, so definitely these are not the places where women can be found, women's movement can be found, but we see a very active, we see a very active artist scene, we see a very active um also queer resistance, we see that the, the imagery of what a Kurdish woman has to be is challenged and people are really fighting for that. I've been working with the Center for Gender and Development Studies in Slemania, which was repeatedly attacked by the Islamist actors that Nilufer talked about, that repeatedly slander and smear all kinds of organizations that are active. However, I would say that one big problem is Yes, I would agree that um, the one of the big parties that is a counter model to the feminist model of HDP is Hudapad. But we should not as underestimate that in Bakur as well, there is a huge part of the population that is still socially conservative and that still sees the woman's role in a specific place. But the fact that the role of the woman could change was because of a lot of grassroots work of the PKK. The PKK managed in the 80s um, and 90s to study society. And um, if we look at the writings of uh, Saki Nujansis, she is writing how in detail they have studied from village to village, from city to city, the specific um, uh, structure, um, the, the specific setting, the actor networks of how things were working and what how women could be um, um, empowered. And then when we look at Bashur, I see that um, sometimes there is a try to kind of use a model that worked for women in Bakur for women in Bashur. I don't think that really it does work. Um, actually, in Bashur, we have the complete opposite situation. We have a generation of women from the uh, 60s and 70s that have been extremely open, extremely open, extremely engaged in academics and in, in, in arts and science and all kinds of areas of life. 
And it was um, the, the movements like the Muslim Brotherhood that have completely hollowed this out in all of these countries. We should not forget these Islamist movements in Kurdistan region. They belong to the regional network of um, the Muslim Brotherhood, the Salafist movements. They have been supported by Iran as well. So this is really a regional topic. So also if people want to... Um, you know, di divide um, Hamas from this general topic, I don't think that it's really working because Hamas is part of this general network of Islamist actors that are completely hollowing out the region. And so what we have to do is that um, the Kurdistan region of Iraq, they need a renaissance of that free Kurdish woman, of that free Kurdish woman that used to be there. Sakina Jansis was referring to Leila Qasim, who was executed in 1972 in my hometown of Khanaqin, as uh, one of the first Kurdish women to be executed in the resistance. So this is something that has to be referred to. And I think if we find a positive referral, um, then this change can happen as well. And another topic is, I think we talked a lot about where Jinjian Azadi as a slogan comes from. But I think the interesting thing in Rushalat in Iranian Kurdistan is that despite the oppression, despite 45 years of the mullahs being in power, the women were so extremely strong in this region, so extremely organized, so extremely vocal and um, inspiring also, that I think we need to do some social research on how that happened. I think we even don't understand the social dynamics that led to this re revolution. I think we can learn a lot from them. Um, and uh, yeah. And yeah, I see, I just, um, I just got uh, also an, a question on the on the queer issue. Yeah, so, um, the the matter of the queer issue in, in Kurdistan region in Iraq is it's very dangerous because um, uh, same sex um, uh, relationships and in general premarital sex is is illegal in Iraq and Kurdistan region and um, the body um, the the body of young people is extremely policed on a very very strict level like it's it's it can be seen in every single place and in, in public and so for queer people it's even harder we also had a lot of um uh transphobic and queerphobic uh, murderers um there have been uh, the the case of uh, um Dusky, for example that was in 2022 um, but also femicides against women that were choosing an open lifestyle, um, like uh, the singer uh, Maya, in, um, also in 2022. Um, a lot of these people are kind of organizing very much underground, but also in different scenes. As I said, the art scene is very important. The music scene is very important. Um, people are trying to establish different spaces of public. And I think you can see this very much as difference when you look at the difference between Erbil and Sleimania. In Erbil, you have a lot of public spaces like cafes, for example, which are very much corporate, very, very much often Turkicized, like they belong to Turkey, have like 20 TV channels and 5 million blogs. Like people are engaged in public life there. And I feel like they are looking for an alternative and I think they need a tailor fit kind of approach um, to their kind of dynamic that they have, the potential that they have. Thank you, Justin. Uh, any other questions from the participants? Okay, then I have the uh, last question to Mundur and uh, Jürgen. Maybe we can start with Mundur and then Jürgen, you can also add some aspects. Um, we talked about um, the issue of breaking the silence um, about Turkey's war crimes. Um, not, how can we do it, uh, not only in the context of states, but also in the context of the Western societies? Well, that's a, that's a big question. Uh, I, I would like to start by saying that I agree with what Nilofer said, that what in the end matters is what happens within the Kurdish communities themselves. And I have sometimes uh, quoted uh, an activist uh, uh, I met in Ahmed some years ago, who said to us, this was a delegation, visiting delegation, uh, don't worry about us. We will we will fight. 
in the end, and we will be victorious in the end. But worry about Europe. Worry about the outside world. Save it from the humiliation of silence and inaction. And this, of course, uh, brings us to your question of how to uh, break the silence. You see, we are always looking for tools. And although it is correct that uh, one should not wait for uh, the withdrawal of the, the terrorist uh, definition to, to, to take the next step, but it is, it is a tool, it's a, it's, a, it's a reason to discuss the Kurdish uh, issue in our part uh, of the world. Uh, another, uh, another tool we have is gender politics, because when you talk about the Kurds and, uh, and Abdullah Salah's ideology and, uh, uh, in the, and the importance attached to uh, uh, this ideology, gender ranks highest. In, our, in, in my parts, at least, you know, this is what people are very interested in. And this is what interested me most when I first uh, visited uh, Kurdistan to see, and this is in, in, within the Turkish uh, boundaries, uh, to see that this ideology was also to be found in practice. You know, when you met organizations, you met the leadership of trade unions and, and political uh, groups and parties, you know, you always saw this uh, gender politics uh, being respected. And I found that very inter interesting indeed and convincing. Although one, of course, knows that, it, you know, when you look at millions of people, there are all kinds of people, all kinds of individuals, all kinds of traditions, etc. But this, however, is a political trend which is visible, which is visible. And that is very appealing to, to the outside world, I believe. Now, how to break the silence on, uh, on war crimes? Uh, I think uh, there was talk of chemical weapons being used in the, in the, in the, by the Turkish army in the border regions. And uh, there were there were appeals to the organization for the prohibition of chemical weapons in the Hague to have this investigated. Uh, just this plea, this this demand that this be investigated, had an effect in itself. You know, one one uh, you know one, one's attention was uh, called to this. I think there should be a lot of such requests and demands to international uh, institutions to investigate uh, uh, war crimes and allegations of, uh, uh, of uh, war crimes. I think, uh, I, th I think that uh, when you go to the public, not to the German state or to states, or the NATO structures at all, but to the public, there is a great deal of sympathy for Kurds. And, uh, and uh, there is a great deal and growing uh, knowledge about the subjugation of Kurds and, uh, and uh, the way human rights have been broken on them, I think. So it's a, I don't know, it's a, it's a question of just plodding on, really. And uh, and uh, that we all uh, do our best, you know, to 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 uh, uh, to do our bit. I come from a tiny community, a tiny country, but uh, I'll tell you, my I, I use this visit of ours very well indeed. You know, in 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 all media, there are to be found in Iceland, and uh, and uh, I don't know, uh, it's. It's a question of 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 uh, everybody doing their 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 their, their best, and uh, I certainly pledge to do that. 
as as well as I possibly can. Thank you. <clears throat> you have you anything to add? Yeah, a little bit only. Uh, in general, I I can underline only what uh, Edmundo said. Uh, you 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 need a continuous uh, connection to uh, to different medias. Uh, I I think, yeah, in in the German uh, newspaper Der Spiegel uh, has been uh, published uh, last weekend. Uh, a very very long report uh, on uh, Kurdish uh, uh, refugees uh, to Germany, and uh, it was uh, reported from the point of view of the police, of the German police, uh, how to fight uh, um, human trafficking. And, and the uh, head of, of human trafficking uh, was uh, just a Kurd uh, living in Essen. Uh, and uh, that I, I think that's not very good. Uh, it, it was not aggressively uh, against Kurds, uh, but it was uh, under, the surface, uh, under the surface, under the carpet, uh, Mm, a little bit problematic from my point of view, or it was problematic because, uh, yeah, refugees uh, are Kurds, and on the other side, uh, the trafficking uh, uh, is organized by by Kurds as well. That bring Kurds in a in a bad uh, um, in a in a bad light, uh, and and that uh, on a very very uh, prominent uh, place of uh, of the website of uh, Der Spiegel. And I think if you want to to face that, uh, then you need really a little many many work uh, with uh, with journalists. Uh, you, you have to find journalists uh, to contact them regularly and explain them uh, what you are doing, what is going on, uh, why you are doing what, uh, and uh, to to explain why uh, what is going on, what what Turkey is doing uh, against the Kurds, it's not enough. Also, there there are a lot of uh, of information. If you are interested, if you are part of the of the inside uh, the, 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 the internal circle, then you can get a lot of uh, information on on special uh, websites. That's uh, not the problem. Uh, about Af Afrin and and uh, there are a lot of uh, information from Kaneka uh, about uh, what's going on, but th there there is no bridge to the to the wider media uh, and and from my point of view, it it is necessary to think about how you can get uh, or how you can build a bridge to the to the to a broader media and and to a, broader public it's not easy but but i think often it, it depends that's my uh, my experience uh, over, over many years uh, you you have to to find people in 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 medias uh, they they are interested they are open they are ready to to uh, yeah to 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 deal with these issues, and you have to inform them. You you you, you have to 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 be in contact with, uh, with them continuously. That's that's really important. If you don't uh, build up such uh, connections, uh, then you can't bring anything in in public. Thank yeah. you very much. Mm, we have reached the end of today's panel. This. Discussion. Thank you, dear Nurifer, Dastan, Okmundur, and Jürgen for your important contribution to this panel. And thank you to all participants here in the Zoom room and also on YouTube for joining this event. And I'm very uh, much looking forward to welcoming you in another Kutakat panel discussion. I think we will have uh, many opportunities um, as long as um, the war in Kurdistan and in the Middle East continues, also all the world in the world. So thank you for joining us and uh, have a good evening. Goodbye. Thank you. Thank you to you. There's some...
Thank you. Bye.